Hi everybody, I'm Federico. As Alexander was mentioning, I'm running Cypress Rust, which is a Rust user group. So if you're interested about Rust, if you want to learn, it's an amazing language to use. I highly recommend you to visit and to, um, well, make you feel yourself heard in the uh, Discord. And um, in the CDC Discord, by the way. So yeah, you'll find the, the, that's the link to access the community. You can come uh, chat with us, we are friendly. And uh, we talk about a lot of cool stuff. And uh, yeah, uh, today I want to talk about uh, generative AI in Rust. So it's 2023. Everybody wants a slice of the AI case. And uh, nobody wants to use third-party APIs. Come on, it's for uh, losers. Everybody can do that. It's easy. It's easy to implement them, sure. Uh, it will get like the business requirement done, but then uh, you, are, you are into user restriction. You are not free to do what you want with the API. Uh, you have to pay for the usage and like the cost of API calls to ChatGPT or, or MidJourney that it can adapt. And they are very hard to customize. Uh, you might know if you tried, for example, Eleven Labs or MidJourney. Sure, you might get some occasional good uh, results. And let's be honest, they are pretty good results in general. <laughs> but then uh, it's really hard to customize them, to fine tune them uh, and say, okay, I know I want something slightly different, but better, something with my brand maybe, who knows. So they're very hard to customize. So the only solution for this is to go and implement it on your own servers. So the first thing you're going to go, um, uh, you're going to uh, look up in the open source community and you'll find a lot of Python projects. And uh, um, Python uh, is, a, is a very simple language, uh, but it's plugged by a series of problems. So the, the worst of the role, in my opinion, is that the package managers are a nightmare, complete nightmare. If you're going to start trying to use Python projects, especially in the AI space, you'll end up using pip, poetry, Conda, Anaconda, Miniconda, and like for every different project you try, you need to set up a different package manager. It's insane. So like um, something that I did to circumvent this problem is to use Nix, which is another um, really nice open source, pro um, open source program, which allows you to define um, a, a, an environment in which you can work. So that you can, it's very nice, you can get into a directory and you switch to the current environment. So it's like, oh, this new AI problem arises, I need mini content installed, Brr, I create a mix file, and then once I get into the directory, and only then I will get my mini content environment. And in another directory, I will have, I don't know, just people maybe. So uh, the other problem that Python faces is the lack of typings. And uh, well, I, I'm really into types, I, I like them, I love them. And uh, I used to be into Haskell. Uh, um, I, I like TypeScript because of like the, the extra capabilities you can, you can get and the extra maintainability that your software requires after using types. So yeah, obviously I want types. So um, after I started programming in Python, um, I was not that there were like bugs that didn't make sense that I would have called if I had types. So what's the solution? Do we have a solution? Can we do better in any way? Of course you can, we have a <laughs> <laughs> so Rust uh, is a type language, it's safe, uh, it's, uh, it, it has a great community, the, the, the Rust community is very open, very friendly, and uh, um, we also have like a metro company that is contributing to a lot of the AI tools in Rust, and uh, it's a company that I'm sure is focused only on doing good, hugging face. <laughs> Okay, so we might have spoiled my bigger reveal about like the open rail license later on, but yeah, Hugging Face uh, does uh, a lot of uh, um, Apache to uh, license software that you can use, and uh, um, a few of them are using Rust, and they really allow you to be productive and hit the ground running. So we're looking to them, we're going to try to avoid all the um, badly licensed stuff, <laughs> and uh, yeah, then let's go on. So Hugging Face, uh, we are ready to talk about it. It's basically a GitHub for AI stuff. Um, it, it allows you to filter uh, even by license. So if I want it here, I'm, I'm just like accessing Apache 2 models on uh, hiking phase. So this is the good part if you want. Um, then of course, yeah, they're trying to innovate on licensing and uh, trying to impose uh, weird rules on us. Um, and like we, we mentioned already, you can see open rail over there. That's the, the type of license they're sponsoring in which uh, you basically need to uh, behave in a way, in whatever hugging face believes is right. Uh, so anyway, let's have a look at what we can, uh, what uh, hugging face has to offer. Uh, but first, uh, we should probably get some um, idea of what a neural network is, because this is like a 
this can be quite complicated and I'm definitely the worst person to explain you all this. But I have some knowledge and uh, you can think of a neural network as kind of a lasagna. You know lasagna, the Italian dish? It's made in layers. And um, the inputs uh, get fed into this lasagna and uh, in the lasagna you're going to find weights and biases. So weights uh, is another assumption that gets multiplied, uh, biases gets added uh, to the input. And then uh, uh, the, um, the result can be observed, uh, which means it goes out of the network and gets returned to the user, or it goes to the next layer. And then it will do more things, uh, it will interact with other um, of, of, our, uh, of the inputs that got passed into the network. And in the end, we're going to get some results that mimic human, uh, the human uh, thinking process. In order to get the data into this uh, neural network, we want to convert them to some sort of IDs so that we can, uh, um, we can use these steps to, um, um, to make it easy for, uh, it's, it's, um, to make it easy for software to process this data. Because we, in the, in our, when we are talking about the neural network, that's basically a bunch of matrix multiplications. So we don't want to deal with strings and do silly things with them. So we're gonna take everything and we're gonna use uh, uh, some uh, uh, vocabularies list to convert them to IDs. And uh, these IDs, um, we, we see later on that these IDs can be used also to add extra meaning and to, um, have, uh, um, and, and to add extra notions to our, to our neural network. Um, this is because like we can represent every entity inside a neural network um, on multiple dimensions which means that like, let's say that I uh, put something in a neural network and it's a ball, and it's a ball, so I can say it's round, I can say it's red, and like these are already two dimensions. I might have, yeah, it's translucent, uh, I can say, oh, it's a part instead. So I can add all these dimensions, and then I can tag and convert uh, appropriately all my, um, all the other entities that get into the network, and then I can see where they sit uh, in terms of like, uh, um, I guess the relationship between these ends. So this is very, very powerful. Um, so again, this is the tokenization. We are converting our data into numbers. And um, it can be done with text, it can be done with images. In images normally you split by pixel. Uh, it can be done with audio. I'm not sure how they do it with audio, but maybe something with the audio waves, uh, most likely. Um, and then once we have our model, um, we kind of need to decide that what frame or machine learning frames we are using. And uh, these are three of the biggest one, JX, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch. And um, this framework, uh, they generally have their own types, uh, they, their own format uh, for representing neural networks. And they have a lot of uh, uh, different behaviors between one another. So like, it's kind of annoying getting to interact with uh, uh, well, all of them really. Uh, sometimes you find yourself writing conversion script from one type of model to another because you don't want to add an extra framework to your pipeline. Uh, so yeah, it's not an ideal situation. Um, Face um, came up with uh, a couple of tools uh, that uh, uh, I think they are very well strategic and place to build their empire really. Uh, so they build transformers as safe tensors. So safe tensors, it's a file format uh, that uh, has uh, some better characteristics in terms of uh, safety. Uh, so like in safety as in uh, cyber security, like you're not gonna get, get hacked and uh, they're not gonna steal all your bitcoins because you run some models from someone on the internet. Uh, oh, sorry. And, um, and so yeah, safety and uh, performance, it's written in Rust, so um, it's, uh, it, it, can manage, it manages the memory very, very well. Um, and it's, um, it, it generally outperforms the other solution used that, by the other frameworks. So this is this created an ecosystem in which a lot of the people interacting with the, with the AI, they just pick safe tensors. They, uh, they have a, a, an interface on top of the Rust library so that you can access this API via Python. Um, and this allows interoperability with like all the other libraries that do AI. Um, they also build transformers. Transformers, it's, uh, um, it's an insane library uh, because they, they basically collected a lot of models. And again, some of them are like Apache 2 licenses. Some of them, they have the new funky license. And um, as a developer, sometimes you don't even know what you're running. You're just saying, oh yeah, I'm running like sentiment analysis now, but you don't know, oh, okay, actually I'm running this uh, 
BERT model that, uh, has, uh, um, that, that is uh, using the open rail license. And this is a great way to infect the ecosystem because if users stop caring about what they're using, like uh, they can just come up with a new model tomorrow and say, hey, look, we made uh, an improvement over your natural language processing model, and now um, you should use it. And everybody will jump aboard because they're going to be like, yeah, sure, why not? Why shouldn't I? And they don't stop and think, of course. Um, there's another, there is another, oh, actually, by the way, Transformers is just written in Python. So this was like actually one of the first moves they did into the AI ecosystem. So they, this is probably, and that's why I think it's probably like the core of their strategy, because they really wanted to get uh, um, into the hands of as many developers as possible. Um, instead of safe tensors, it's, uh, it has the core in Rust and an interface in Python, and it's becoming quite trendy. We started seeing it in a lot of projects, uh, both in Python and JavaScript. Uh, I do some JavaScript as well sometimes. And uh, there are a couple of projects. There is Prisma, which you might know. It's a very famous ORM. There is Bio, which is a linter, and um, previously called ROM. And they both have a Rust core for performance, uh, and then they have a JavaScript library. So for us, Rust developers, this is a field day because uh, we get uh, libraries that get used by a lot of developers, developers who might or might not have in the Rust community. And um, at the same time, like we have a library that, uh, um, that is very useful and it's written in our language that we can integrate easily. The entire ecosystem of native, um, native languages benefits from this really because it's not hard to interface with a Rust library, but and I'm sure, like, not a lot of the people developing in Native developer will be interested in this kind of solution. Um, there is another library we haven't talked about, which is Tokenizer, which is another library by our favorite company, Hugging Face. And, um, yeah, it's uh, same core in Rust and Python, and it just does uh, this thing. So it's tokenizing text, uh, and it does it blazingly fast, uh, and it uh, basically overtook all the other libraries. So all the projects I see doing tokenization of some sort, they're using tokenizers. So they're very well embedded into the, uh, into the AI ecosystem. Um, so probably a pragmatic developer nowadays, someone that probably doesn't care as much about types, uh, that doesn't care about uh, um, like the package manager situation in Python, they will just go and use transformers. I'm going to be realistic with you. Um, but there are also crazy people like me that will try to do it in Rust. So, <laughs> Um, there are a few traits that can help you if you want to follow me in this crazy journey. Um, the first one is Raspberry, which is uh, focusing on uh, natural language processing task. So it will uh, allow you to do things like summarization of text, uh, question answering based on context, uh, um, sentiment analysis, um, a lot of things really. Diffusers is the alternative to um, um, it's uh, what enables you to run stable diffusion. Stable diffusion, you might have heard of it, is the, um, it's, um, uh, it's an AI model that allows you to generate images. And uh, all this library is based on uh, uh, TCHRS. So TCHRS is uh, um, basically PyTorch for Rust. Uh, and it has a very similar API to PyTorch. It's using uh, the same source library that PyTorch uses. So this is a library called Torchly, which is written in C++ for performance. And um, so it's uh, basically, uh, it's performance-wise, compatibility-wise, uh, it's like running PyTorch. So when I saw this trait, I was like, okay, well, I don't really need to use PyTorch in Python. I have like the same thing at home. I just need to write some of the code, uh, some of the glue code uh, that Hugging Face so comfortably put into the Transformers library. Um, and again, if I'm doing some natural language processing stuff, the friendly people at Transfer, they are really little of that. Uh, the last library I want to tell you about, which is, uh, um, it's a very interesting topic, and uh, I don't think a lot of people know about this one. It's a freight called uh, Candle. And uh, Candle, uh, uh, it used to be a project by a French researcher uh, who is also the author of TCHRS. And uh, it started as like a, as a, a new machine learning framework. So this is planning to compete with PyTorch, JAX. Uh, and um, the key feature, the, the unique selling proposition is that they want to be fast and minimal. They want to run serverless. So if you get serverless, uh, uh, like if you get AI models running on serverless, I mean, like we are shifting more and more towards the scenario we were discussing before during the panel, where like uh, computing really becomes meaningless. 
like it's just going to be um, like it's just going to be on the hands of uh, like who can control this uh, uh, the, the kind of ecosystem. So, um, because I like to get into the details, please, I'm going to show you a little bit. Okay. So, this is going to be using the uh, rust vert framework. Uh, and this is just to show you, like, how easy it is to interact uh, and, uh, again, you can do the same thing with transformers, yes, but this is in Rust, so it's much better. <laughs> okay, so I have a question here. What's the coolest CDC event? And then, like, I gave some context. So the coolest event event is the definitely CDC Software Freedom Day, but the Mule Wine one was a close second. Oh, you mean like the theme of my editor? I think it's against my religion. <laughs> But I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, I just have no idea because I never changed it before. Team, thank you. Life plus. Life plus. Oh, that's better. Yeah, sure. I can also close these things as well. Nice. Perfect. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is a question answering model. So, like, uh, um, this is my question. This is the context I'm, I'm giving to the model, and I want the model to predict correctly and tell me his honest opinion about the coolest event. So, I'm going to go ahead and run it so we can hopefully see the first result, and then it will take some time to, to run the second one. Yeah, I'm not going to wait one hour to run that. Oh no. Oh no. Okay, that's bad. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, not with me, I'm recording with my phone, but uh, I can, uh, if you don't mind, I'll connect to your Merci beaucoup. Anyway, uh, all that this is doing, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a bug that is uh, trying to fetch some data from the internet because uh, this should all be cached. Okay, so we already got an answer. So with a, a score of 0.91, so it's pretty sure. So I would say it's almost a definitive answer, but yeah, CDC Software Freedom Day is the best CDC event ever. <laughs> so let's go and see uh, some other tasks that you can do with uh, Raspbert. So this is a summarization task. I want like, I'm gonna give him like this long text. Uh, it's, uh, it's about something, uh, a new planet that has been found in space. It's so long, uh, and I, I didn't even read it, to be honest. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm asking the model to summarize it. And, again, like, I'm going to get, like, a short description. And, yeah, we can see that, like, uh, okay, it's mentioning about wet, uh, water vapor. Uh, it's mentioning about, like, the distance from Earth. So it collected, like, um, what were the most important information and returned them to me. This is the GP2 generator, and uh, GPT-2, it's a, it's a very useful tool uh, uh, still now because, uh, well, it's, it's being released by OpenAI under a very permissive license. So, like, we, it's, it's Apache 2, um, it's, um, uh, and it's, uh, its performance is pretty good. And uh, even if it's not ChatGPT 3.5, which I, at this point I, I have a feeling they will never release, um, it still performs pretty well, and it's pretty good for building chats. And uh, in this in this context in this context, I'm uh, asking it to complete a couple of phrases. So let's see what it thinks about foxes in Cyprus. Uh, the fox jumped out of the fox mouth and ran away. Okay, yeah, well that doesn't sound too nice to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, like in previous tests, I got some answer. Like uh, I think there is a famous phrase that it uses to test font. You know, the fox the fox jumped uh, over the window, something like that. Well, anyway, something else. And instead, let's see Cyprus. Cyprus is a great place to live, but it's also one of the most expensive places to live in the world. <laughs> With a big price, huh? Wow! <laughs> yeah, they're all celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is um, 
not indicative of like the current the, the current gold standard of performance. I would say like for something like that, uh, like if I were to sell this to a client, they would laugh at me, um, and they would expect something like Lama 2, which is roughly on the level of uh, um, on um, of uh, ChatGPT 3.5. But I can't really run it on this computer. Uh, but I can show you the code that you can use to run a Llama on this computer. But the nice thing about Llama is that uh, I think they made a bit of a strategic mistake uh, with Llama because they uh, initially said that it, it wouldn't be available com for commercial use. And uh, this was enough to prop the community and say, no, hey, we, we really need an open uh, version of Llama. Um, so they came up with a lot of different solutions. Uh, there is a university in Dubai that released the Falcon. There is Open Llama, which is compatible. Uh, so there are a lot of choices that you can that you can use instead. Um, but yeah, like uh, like I said, uh, just to prove you, like uh, just to show you the code that you can use in Rust. Uh, um, like for Llama, because it's a model that uh, uh, it's uh, kind of new, it hasn't been embedded yet into a user-friendly solution like Raspberry. So the code is kind of long. You need to know like a lot of of the details about like the configuration of your model. And uh, you need to go like nitty gritty to the detail and implement like uh, a feeding forward model. So uh, you are using TCHRS to do this so that you can use an API uh, that is similar to, uh, to what uh, um, people on PyTorch implement. And uh, this is basically like the work that is being done inside the transformer module. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it's not trivial. It's kind of long. <laughs> We're not going to go through that because I don't understand half of it. <laughs> but um, yeah, as you can see, it's not, a, it's not an easy task. But it can be done. Like I deployed the solution based on Llama or Rust. And uh, again, like the major disadvantage that this solution has is that you have to bring with you all the entirety of PyTorch. So like when you go and deploy it, it's a bit of a pain. Um, but it's something that can be solved, really. And the same thing with uh, uh, stable diffusion. Stable diffusion uh, uh, has a different story compared to Llama because uh, they released it under this license called OpenRail we've been talking about. And um, yeah, so the way it works is that uh, um, like I think people just think, yeah, that's fine. Like I'm not going to be evil, so I don't need to worry about this. And uh, they never offered a real alternative. So I run it just to show you that we can generate something, but the result is going to be terrible because on this uh, potato computer, I I don't really get, uh, I, yeah, I don't have enough uh, power to do it in a reasonable time. Uh, so I think the prompt is a ball of fire, uh, which is me being frustrated like, like after hours trying to compile on an Intel CPU um, some image. And um, yeah, I, I was thinking, yeah, this is going to be easy enough, right? Uh, but yeah, we're going to give you some time and come back to this later. And um, yeah, uh, for Llama, uh, another solution I wanted to show you is a Tiny Llama, which uh, again, uh, it's another uh, Apache 2 licensed uh, alternative to Llama. Uh, the special characteristic is that it's very, very small, like why a Llama model will uh, be like, uh, I don't know, um, it, they're going to be very heavy, it's just like four gigabytes. Um, so it's quite uh, portable and it's, it runs faster than others uh, on, uh, on PC that can run it. And this PC is not one of those, unfortunately, as I tried. Uh, so yeah, let's go and see our disappointing image. Yeah, so this is a ball of fire. Not quite, not quite. But again, like when I run this on my uh, other PC, and uh, my other PC has a 1490, which is like the equivalent of like, my other car is a Ferrari, <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, it can generate some good stuff. So like there is nothing wrong with the integration. It's merely like a matter of like how detailed you want it. And on this computer, I really can't. Um, so yeah, let's go back to our keynote. Okay. Okay, so we already talked about some of these topics, but yeah, I would say like the, the most interesting thing about this is that like we've seen a reaction in the open source community for Llama just when they say, no, you can't use it to set the profit. And Llama 2 instead um, has a different license. So they're basically saying uh, um, you, can, uh, you can use it commercially unless you are one of our competitors. So it's discriminatory in use, no? In the sense that they, were, they want to prevent like uh, the competitors of uh, uh, Meta, Meta to, uh, to use their software. 
And uh, for Lama 2, we have seen a few models, a few open source models based on um, based on the similar similar architecture that uh, was done for Lama. And this probably because it was low effort to do. So like, I don't think people really care about having an open Lama at that point, but yeah, they were like, yeah, well, we can also do V2 with basically the same model, just better. So they went and did it. Uh, for stable diffusion, uh, yeah, basically the restrictions are just saying don't be evil, and like it's a concept that really escaped my mind because like if I'm a criminal, why should I obey a software license? No, um, so it's um, yeah, it's just punishing us really, just like putting a step forward in the direction of saying yeah, that's what you can do, that's you can't, that's what you can't do. And if tomorrow they are gonna be like yeah, well actually you use too much CO2 to run the software. It's against the license now. Look, they could very well do it. So yeah, finally, we got nothing. Uh, as an of stable diffusion. Uh, stable diffusion uh, went through a few versions. It went through 1.5, 2.1, but yeah, nothing. And there is nothing rem remotely close. Uh, NVIDIA is uh, coming up with, um, with an alternative, like they published a paper recently, it's called eDiffy. Uh, and that might be an alternative to stable diffusion. Um, OpenAI has DALI 3, but OpenAI forgot the, 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 their name, so they, they are not open anymore. And I doubt we will release anything ever again. So, yeah, like, um, it's awesome to do AI, guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is an example of like the stable diffusion infection, no? and it's quite interesting to think about. So, this is a CVT AI, which is uh, it's another platform where people upload the models. Uh, uh, they're all based on stable diffusion. So this is an entire website based on stable diffusion. And the models are all fine-tuned to do different things. So some models might be focused on doing like realistic looking photos, others cartoon-like, and this one is a Baldur's Gate portrait, which looks awesome, it's downloaded. So um, yeah, like all these models, they were made by people that are probably benefiting from free software every day. And uh, they were forced to release it under this new stupid license just because uh, stable diffusion uh, is the only model where you can do this kind of stuff. And I mean, like, not, I'm not trying to defend them because I'm sure they don't care too much about the license, but like, that's the direction where we are going. Um, so on this happy tone, let's talk about Fudrant, which is uh, instead an example of the, com the community being uh, um, active and producing something of value uh, and, uh, and uh, releasing it for free. Uh, plus uh, sending a commercial service on top of it. So like I'm, I'm, I really admire what, what these guys are doing. So Qdrunt is a vector database uh, written in Rust. And um, what is a vector database? So we can go back to our um, image from before. This is the tokenization process. A vector database, uh, um, in, like the way in which you use a vector database is uh, as a way to uh, look for things similar to what the user is looking for. And you want that similar to be semantically relevant. So like uh, if I have uh, a, bunch of, uh, um, a bunch of phrases, for example, a bunch of sentences, um, and uh, some of them might, may contain like uh, uh, an answer to a user query, uh, I want to return the sentences that are the most relevant to the user query. So the way you do it, uh, and this is, this is a quite a magical process, but like first you go through tokenization. So you convert your sentence using a natural language model um, into the, the magic numeric ideas from before. Uh, and then uh, you turn it into um, embeddings, which means that uh, uh, you are evaluating uh, um, the, the, the data that you just tokenized under a lot of different dimensions. and um, and then uh, you will get uh, um, you will get numbers that uh, are closer when the concepts are closer according to the natural language model you use to encode this data. So this means that uh, um, in practice, this means that I have a, a natural language model like uh, the most popular one is called the old Mini 11, and that's uh, um, that has a knowledge of like uh, what we mean when we uh, write something and. Um, I can encode all the content that I want to index into my database using this model, and then I will encode the user query. And then I can ask QDRAND, hey, given this user query, which, um, which uh, um, embeddings in the, in the database are closest to this query? And then I will get a list of five, 10. I, 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 you probably want to be generous on like on the amount of uh, items you're returning because uh, 
Maybe there is going to be like other data that is similar for different reasons, or reason maybe you don't care particularly about. And then uh, um, you can even feed this into a, um, into a chatbot model, that, and, and you can tell him, you can tell the chatbot, hey, look, this is all the context that I think it's relevant to the user query. Now, Armin, with his extra knowledge, give an answer to the user which makes sense. And uh, time for a second demo. Uh, this time, I'm not going to try to run some code because it would be embarrassing. So I will show you some uh, um, production code. But it's for a service that I haven't released yet, and it's personal, so I'm not infringing anything. So um, this is uh, exactly what uh, I uh, was explaining you right now. So I'm going to go, yeah, I'll make it bigger. So the first thing you want to do when dealing with Qdrunt is to uh, create a collection uh, with some content. So this is the content that you want to index. So I'm using a tokenizer. And uh, it, actually, I don't remember if I'm using tokenizer from, uh, um, from Hugging Face. I don't think I am. No, I'm using, um, I'm using an open source library called uh, uh, the Natural Language Toolkit. And... Um, I think I browse somewhere where I was supposed to. Okay, yeah. So I'm creating, I'm, I'm indexing my content. I'm uh, splitting uh, all the sentences in my content into different, uh, um, into uh, different, uh, um, well, I'm splitting them into sentences. And then for each of these sentences, I'm encoding uh, um, using a natural language model and uh, um, and adding it to uh, my um, vector database. So this, uh, um, well, this is creating the collection, and then uh, I'm inserting all the data that I extracted from my sentences. Uh, at this point, I have a collection in Qdrunt. I can access it, I can inspect it, uh, and it will be full of uh, binary numbers, so you can't really tell much. Uh, and um, that's why what I do is that I also plug the sentence in real text so it's easier to debug. But you don't really have to do that. Um, then uh, when the user arrives on the platform and is like, yeah, um, I have a question and uh, I, want to, um, I want an answer that knows uh, uh, some of the content has been indexed, uh, what I do is this. So uh, the function we want is create chat completion. So what we are doing is uh, um, we are getting, uh, uh, we are querying from Qdrunt uh, uh, all the, our, uh, um, sorry. So we're getting from Qdrunt, uh, no, I think I, I missed one piece, sorry guys. Well, the concept is that I'm getting from Qdrunt uh, uh, all my, Last message content clause search query. Hmm. Okay, yeah. So I'm getting from, Q, from Qdrunt, from the Qdrunt client, uh, I'm querying um, um, using the, as an input, uh, the query made by the user. I'm getting back like a bunch of responses. And then from all these responses, I'm, um, I'm generating a string that looks like this, uh, where I have context the string passed by, um, by the Qdrunt result, and then a source. Uh, this is basically the ID that I have in the database because this enables me to say, oh yeah, I gave an answer and actually the source is uh, like a page 32 of your content. Once I have this, uh, once I have this string, uh, I will pass it, I will create a prompt. Uh, so this is like prompt engineering. Um, I will, uh, and I will pass it to a prompt that looks like this. Uh, so uh, it starts by saying, uh, uh, explain the AI assistant uh, that uh, what it's supposed to do. It will get a context. Uh, the context can have sources. I have a bunch of like precautions, like a worried mom. And then uh, I also give you some examples. So I'm like, okay, the ball look as it was the color red. Um, and then like I, the assistant is gonna be like, okay, the ball is red because, uh, sorry, in the question, and then I'm asking a question, what color is the ball? The ball is red. Um, and this gets uh, repeated one more time, so that like, uh, um, well, I just like to give more data to the model. Uh, and now like uh, the bot just have to do this for the user. So like I'm already prepending to my query context and source. I'm passing down the query from the user. 
and uh, um, a chatbot sufficiently advanced that should be able to reply with the correct answer. Um, interestingly enough, you can even use, use like a less sophisticated uh, um, um, model, for example, the one we saw before. So if you remember before, we also had, uh, um, no, sorry, we also had uh, a question answering model. And uh, this model is using uh, um, something called the Stilbert, which is a model uh, released by Microsoft, if I recall correctly. And they, yeah, it's very good at doing question answering. Um, and the, the only reason I, I'm not, I wouldn't use this in production is because like you need, really need to give it like some context that is accurate because it will be able to get an answer. But like if you give it too much context, like there's going to be a problem with the attention. Like the model wouldn't be able to focus on what's the correct value that needs to be returned. Um, so yeah, again, it depends really on like how you are building your AI pipeline, but um, yeah, you, if you can swap like a cheaper uh, and faster model to run uh, with, uh, and use it instead of a more expensive one, yeah, go for it. Um, and uh, I think that's all. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Very specific. Very specific, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the, of course, is there, like, you, for us above, you want to bring as much stuff as possible into infrastructure, but, uh, if it's, uh, don't you feel it might be a waste of time because it was already implemented even in Python, and sometimes it's way easier to, especially for green boards, to write something immediately instead of trying to implement the same in Rust or other language. Yeah, I agree. It's a very valid point. I think it really depends on the amount of effort you are putting into it. So I'm not developing all this stuff. Again, like there are other companies doing it for me. So uh, for now, I'm, I'm trying at least to reap those benefits. Uh, and um, yeah, I, like the benefits I get in, in deploying Rust is that I can keep my um, my uh, deployment uh, well, much smoother. Like I don't really, like uh, I, I'm, I'm also running some uh, Python application in production and I, I tend to have some problems, especially with memory. Um, and um, so, the, the actual reason for using, um, like the actual reason to use Rust, they, they change like project by project. So like uh, for a lot of projects, this is not a consideration is going to be valid. But like for some things that are running, especially like constrained environment, you probably want to um, avoid having like a um, sudden spike in memory that you might get in the Python, for example. So it's, um, it's a matter of trade-offs. Uh, um, like I think that, uh, again, the work to um, like, now that we have uh, TCH uh, RS, I think uh, implementing a model is not that complicated. It's something that like, uh, um, it's something that people can do uh, in like, a couple of days. So like at that point, you're gonna ask yourself, well, do I really want to deploy this thing uh, or, uh, um, or just go like the normal way and just use a model in Python? Um, like, don't get, me, don't get me wrong. Like I deploy some projects using, for example, Langchain. Langchain is a meta framework that uh, um, uses transformers uh, in the background. And um, uh, yeah, it just like, um, it, it's one level higher than transformers. It allows you to do even more crazy stuff. So for example, Langchain has a solution that is very similar to the one we've seen with Qdrand, where like uh, uh, it can store knowledge into a vector database uh, and then retrieve it for you. Um, and again, like, uh, why did they implement it in Rust? Like I really deployed a project doing that, but I just didn't want for the next project to have to deploy the same infrastructure. So it, it might not be worth for a lot of people. I get it, um, but I think there is a space in the in the in the community for that. Alexei, you want to? Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, it's a valid point. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay.
I think. Yeah, sorry, if you have any hope for uh, an alternative to stable diffusion. Um, I don't think so. Like, um, uh, I, I've been looking for something like that since I started looking into AI, and it's, uh, I think, like, uh, stable diffusion was one of the first models that, that really, like, created a, a wow effect into people because it was very advanced and it came out of nowhere, really. Like, it was very impressive. So I think replicating all that work, uh, it's uh, kind of expensive. So you probably want like a large budget to do that uh, from scratch. Um, now there are some uh, people that uh, like to, like for example, people have been replicating um, um, results that look like mid journey by taking stable diffusion and uh, training on images generated by mid journey. So maybe you could go and have a similar approach in which like uh, you start uh, with a model that is. Uh, uh, that you can uh, kick start in, in house and then uh, maybe you train it on stable diffusion to get better. And I think you're perfectly fine by just using to do that. I don't think it's going to be, uh, I don't think it's become a der derivative of stable diffusion with that. So yeah, there is a, there is a hope uh, if someone is willing to do it. Ah, yeah, 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 that's unstable diffusion. Not great, actually. <laughs> So if anyone is interested in participating in an open source project, <laughs> who might have an idea? Indeed, indeed. Any more questions for Federico? So have you looked into the REST bindings for ICBP? I have, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not a fan because, um, well, it doesn't run as fast on the GPU. On the, it runs, it runs uh, really well on the CPU, but not on the GPU. So I tend not to use it because I, the majority of times when I'm deploying something, it's on GPU. And uh, well, on my own computer, which is like where I usually develop, it's, uh, it's, it's on GPU, so I don't really have much use. Um, but Lama CPP is amazing. Uh, they use a lot of optimization to, to run faster, and they, it's crazy how much faster they managed to get from the beginning. Like they were able to run it on iPhones, uh, on uh, Raspberry Pis, so it's crazy. Yeah, having your own like ChatGPT 3.5 in the Raspberry Pi is kind of mind blowing. Yeah, uh, but that actually answers the question of why rewrites, because uh, they basically just rewrote the uh, inference path that appears C++ with a lot of the operating system data optimizations, and again, it's just mind blowing how fast we have this. Yeah. Mm. There's another project that's really interesting. If you like this kind of performance thing, it's called Open Vino, and it's uh, it's also allowed to uh, leverage some like CPU optimization that make you faster on constrained devices. 